Mongol Tartar conquest of Russia in the early 13th century, a conquest that precipitated the fracture of the medieval Rus civilization, what we now call Russia, with its origins in the Rurikid Muscovite state that rose during the Mongol yoke, stands at a crossroads, straddling the cultural and geographic borders of Europe and Asia, yet not belonging entirely to either. From the 15th century, Muscovite Russia assumed the mantle of headship over Orthodox Christendom, the Third Rome, a somewhat empty boast when one considers that the overwhelming majority of Orthodox believers at the time lived under Muslim and Catholic rulers. The mythos of the Third Rome, however, positioned Russia as the successor to a Byzantine tradition that in contrast to Roman Catholic Europe was perceived as increasingly extra-European. Indeed, later Russian expansion was directed eastwards, first by subduing the successor states to the Mongol Tatar dominion, the Golden Horde and the Khanate of Kazan, and second by claiming the vast emptiness of Siberia. Russia had reached the Pacific Ocean before establishing a definitive presence on the Black and Baltic Seas. For all its territory, Russia by the end of the 17th century was effectively landlocked. In the east, Russia hadn't the logistical capacity to challenge the last great Chinese dynasty, the Qing, at the zenith of its power, to become itself a Pacific power. Peter the Great successfully challenged Swedish power in the Baltic and established the new capital of St. Petersburg, the Window on the West, in imitation of the European powers of the Netherlands, France, Great Britain. Catherine the Great and her Generalissimo Potemkin looked to the legacy of ancient Greece and Byzantium through the establishment of Curzon on the Black Sea and the conquest of the Crimea. Though it should be noted that Catherine is chiefly remembered for her acquisition of Polish-Lithuanian territories, at the time of her death she has sent an expedition to conquer Persia, while her successor Paul envisaged a Cossack conquest of India. Though fanciful, if any of these grand projects had succeeded in part, Russia would have emerged as an established power in the Persian Gulf and the Indian Ocean. Such dreams of limitless territorial expansion were checked by two powers in the 19th century that also represented a form of ideological antithesis to autocracy and Tsarism, revolutionary France and Victorian Britain. While the former was ultimately defeated, the latter proved to be Russia's greatest antagonist of the 19th century. As of 1815, with the acquisition of Congress Poland, one can observe the scale of Russian expansion, to the point that the 18th century can be rightfully called the century of Russia. Yet for all its size, Russia's geography still denied her the position of a world power, for even with access to the Baltic and the Black Seas, and with her Arctic and Pacific coastlines, Russia could not project hard power outwards towards the Atlantic, the Mediterranean or the Pacific. For all her gains, Russia was still a regional power operating out of multiple strategic theatres, unlike Great Britain and her supremacy at sea. To project power out through the Atlantic, Russia would have needed access to the ports of the then unfriendly Kingdom of Sweden-Norway. To project power to the Mediterranean and thre threaten Britain's imperial jugular vein in Egypt, Russia would have needed access to the Bosphorus and Dardanelles Straits, an ambition denied so vociferously during the agony of Imperial Russia, the debacle of the Crimean War. The Crimean War, which I have already discussed at length on this channel, is among Russia's most humiliating defeats, other than the immediate ramifications of showcasing to the world that the Russian juggernaut lacked the technological and logistical wherewithal to fight and win a war on its own territory, Russia's territorial designs on the Danubian principalities, the core of modern-day Romania, were temporarily thwarted. The ambitions of Catherine the Great and Potemkin were for naught, as Russia's entire trajectory for southward maritime expansion through to the Aegean and the wider Mediterranean were not only denied, but Russia ceased to be an effective power in its own backwater of the Black Sea.
So how am I qualifying Russia's greatest defeat? To say that Russia has had its share of military calamities and national tragedies is an understatement. In terms of military casualties alone, Russia lost some 12 million soldiers in the Second World War, 3 million in the Great War, and a similar number in the Russian Civil War that followed. Projected further back, Russia lost half a million men in Napoleon's invasion of 1812, 200,000 in Peter the Great's Northern War. Though a factor, military casualties should not determine our criteria. In the case of the Second World War, Russia, as the principal constituent of the Soviet Union, rebounded and carved out an empire in Europe from Mecklenburg to Bulgaria. Though the First World War ended for Russia with the Treaty of brest and subsequently Russia failed to recover the bulk of those territories, ceded territories in the Baltic, Poland, Belarusia, Bessarabia and the Ukraine, even in the wake of Germany's collapse and the civil conflicts that followed, a domineering and ascendant Russia ultimately emerged in the succeeding conflict, that being the Second World War. Though admittedly a Shakespearean cliché, I am reminded of that famous passage from Hamlet, to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take up arms against a sea of troubles, and by opposing, end them. Rather than fall into a nihilistic morass against seemingly insurmountable odds, see the state dissolve, orthodox Christianity crater, the essence of Russian civilization, its culture dissipate and scatter to the wind, Russia has consistently absorbed the most devastating and near-fatal blows only to emerge the stronger for it. I count the irrepressibility of this civilization, what communists would refer to as the great Russian chauvinism, as accounting for Russia's survival during its long period of Soviet captivity. World War II is the most obvious example, but the historical precedent is hard set. Following the burning of Moscow in 1812, within two years, Cossacks would occupy Paris. After the rout of the Russian armies at Narva and the advance of Sweden as far as the Ukraine, the Swedes would be defeated, their empire left to crumble. At the height of Muscovy's time of troubles, Polish-Lithuanian troops would occupy Moscow and attempt to place a Catholic Polish prince on the throne of Russia, only for Moscow to be liberated, the Romanovs enthroned, beginning the Tsardom's long recovery in the 17th century. The Muscovite state itself was born out of that great medieval cataclysm that fractured the original Rus, the Mongol-Tartar invasion. The greatest defeats for Russia were defeats without recovery. Here I return to the logic of Russian expansionism and the strategic limitations imposed on her by her geography. Even Russia's greatest triumphs were in a sense pyrrhic victories if one perceives Russia as trapped within a cage. Territorial conquest swelled that cage rather than breaking it. What did it matter if Stalin occupied Berlin if the Soviet Union had no outlet through Turkey, Greece and Iran? What did it matter if Catherine the Great and Alexander I took Poland if they could not take Constantinople? What did it matter if Peter the Great established a presence on the Baltic, the Baltic which was ultimately a European lake, with Denmark guarding the gates? What I am describing here is a manifest destiny denied, where Russia tried and definitively failed to escape its confines, remaining forever caged, albeit the largest cage in the world. Take Tsar Paul's dreams of invading British India, for example. The logic of southward expansionism carried through recently to the Soviet-Afghan war in the 1980s. A Soviet victory in the aptly named Graveyard of Empires especially in view of America's recent humiliation, would have opened up a new front in the Cold War against American-aligned Pakistan with its access to the Indian Ocean, with all the pressure that could be exerted on both India and Iran. Instead, the Soviet war machine was defeated by the Mujahideen, American-backed Islamic guerrillas. While the war in Afghanistan is sometimes attributed as a contributing factor to the fall of the Soviet Union, I have always viewed the strategic collapse of the Soviet Union as a series of unforced errors, though that is a subject for another time. A hypothetical Soviet victory in Afghanistan should not induce us to believe that there was ever a serious prospect of a Soviet Pakistan, 
though for me at least, it is interesting to envisage all the creative ways in which the Soviets could have adopted a policy of divide and rule, parceling all of the ethnic groups from the Sindhis to the Pashtuns into their own respective Soviet republics. Returning to the Crimean War, here is another potential candidate for manifest destiny denied. It is important to distinguish between naval access through the Bosphorus and Dardanelles Straits into the Mediterranean and the realistic prospect of direct Russian territorial expansion into the Straits. Despite Imperial Russia's spiritual ties to Constantinople, there was never any serious prospect of a governorate or later a Soviet Republic of the Straits. Tsar Nicholas I's territorial designs in the Crimean War were instead in Romania, a staging post from which to induce the Ottoman Empire into remaining a Russian vassal state. A similar logic pertained to the Greek plan of Catherine the Great, creating a Greek-led Fenariot state to be ruled by her grandson Constantine. But as we saw in the Crimean War, vassals can rebel. Had the Greek plan succeeded, would Constantine Romanov be content merely to be his brother Alexander's puppet? Moreover, the Russians did recover from the Crimea War, re-established themselves in the Black Sea, and carved out a sphere of influence in the Balkans. Crimea, however, offers us a piece in the puzzle, for it was in the soul-searching and reconsolidation that followed Crimea that Alexander II began looking towards the East and the potential of an Asiatic Russia, to paraphrase Dostoevsky, a Russian author who needs no introduction. As we turn towards Asia, with a fresh perspective, it is as the Europeans discovering the Americas. For Asia is our America yet to be discovered. In striving for Asia, we will discover a new spirit and strength. Russia was a slave in Europe, but would be a master in Asia. In Europe we are Tatars. In Asia we are Europeans. Our civilizing mission to Asia will restore us and enthrall us. This sentiment is perhaps echoed through Dostoevsky's pale imitation in the Eurasianism of Alexander Dugin. The striving for Asia, however, would amount to the most dramatic instance of manifest destiny denied, a phrase all the more appropriate given Dostoevsky's comparison to America. Russia's greatest defeat was in the conflict that terminated the dream of a Russian empire in Asia caused Russia to lose its first Cold War, the Great Game, left her militarily disgraced in the eyes of the world, precipitated mutiny and revolution, and all this at the hands of a fledgling Far Eastern power. I of course refer to the Russo-Japanese War. The term Great Game usually has specific Central Asian connotations, that being Russian expansion directed towards British India through Central Asia beginning with Paul's abortive Cossack invasion of 1801. Here I designate the specific instance of the Great Game as the Little Game, within the context of the real Great Game, the Anglo-Russian Cold War, commencing with the Greek War of Independence and the breakdown of the Metanician Concert of Europe system in 1827, to the Anglo-Russian Convention, which settled the Persian question in 1907. The little game is perhaps ironically where Russia enjoyed her greatest level of success in terms of pure territorial expansion, though of the three principal Europe Eastern theatres, Central Asia was arguably of the least strategic significance for Russia, compared to Iran and to China. Indeed, the decisive theatre of the real great game was in China, not India. Nevertheless, Russia's Asian expansion predated her rivalry with the British by some centuries, and here it will be instructive to understand how and why Russia turned eastwards. As with the Reconquista in Spain, the expansion of the state of Muscovy began with the great gathering of the Russian lands outside the reach of the Lithuanians, before turning on the Muslim Tatars that had dominated and co-opted the Russians for centuries. With Tsar Ivan the Terrible's conquest of the Khanate of Kazan, the Nexus and the Volga, control over the Volga facilitated Russian expansion southwards, towards Sarai, the capital of the Golden Horde, before the Russians reached the shores of the Caspian Sea. Further expansion to the west was thwarted by the Lithuanians, Swedes and the Ottomans. Expansion into the steppes of Central Asia was thwarted by the then mighty Khanate of Bukhara, 
leaving a route of expansion open through the Ural Mountains into Siberia. The Siberian campaign was led by Yermak Timofeyevich and his band of 500 Cossacks and foreign mercenaries, effectively the Russian Hernan Cortes. Yermak, commencing his campaign in the 1580s, attacked settlements belonging to the Kante in the Khanate of Sibir, what the Russians were called Yugra, before attacking the Khan's capital at Kashlik. After a five-year war with the Khan, Yermak was forced to retreat, though not before demolishing his capital city of Kashlik. The Russians returned, founded the cities of Tyumen and Tobolsk, defeated the Khan, and sent the royal family to Moscow as hostages. Siberia was depopulated, vast, and replete with furs. At the time of Yermak's conquest, the native tribes throughout the entirety of what is now Asian Russia amounted to little more than a quarter of a million, a number decimated by the arrival of smallpox. These tribes were subjugated on the basis of the Yasak, the fur tribute, while Russia exerted its control of vast territory through a network of river forts, the Ostrogs. In the absence of any major opposition, the Russians expanded eastwards over the course of the 17th century to the Yenisei River, Lake Baikal, ultimately reaching the Pacific coast in 1639 and the borders of Qing China, precipitating a 40-year border war with the Chinese. Russia went from the largest country in Europe to the largest country in the world. In the Treaty of Nechinsk, a border settlement with the Qing was finally reached, releasing Russia from maintaining large and prohibitively expensive garrisons in the east, such as that of Albazin on the Amur River, against Chinese Manchu excursions. The treaty also left Russia in the awkward position of having no feasible outlet into the Pacific, terminating her expansion into the Far East. Peter the Great, in his zeal to exploit Russia's newfound naval power, commissioned a major exploration enterprise under Vitus Bering throughout the northern shores of Siberia, reaching the Kamchatka Peninsula before discovering the Aleutian Islands and Alaska. The goal of this expedition was to discover the great and ultimately fictive Hyperborean continent of Greek legend, Russia's Arctic Australia in the north, if you will. Further, the expedition failed in its secondary objective of finding a navigable northeastern passage for which to circumvent the Pacific and Atlantic and accelerate Russian colonization of the Americas from the north. Russia's Asiatic potential was left effectively dormant until the mid-19th century with the advent of the railway. Prior to the railway and the steamboat, the only semi-efficient way of traversing Siberia was through its waterways, the Ob, Irtysh, Tobol and Chulium system in the west and the Yenisei and the Angara in the east. Five months of the year these rivers would freeze over, during which time passengers would use these same ice-covered rivers to travel by horse-drawn sleigh. Though a colossal undertaking, the railway opened up the possibility of previously inconceivable designs of Siberian navigation and exploitation. This development occurred too late. The residual effects of the Crimean War was for Alexander II to sell Russia's Alas Alaskan holdings to the Americans, fearful that the British, with their presence in Canada, would snatch the barely defended Russian colony and prevent any Russian counterattack through their mastery of the seas. In hindsight, we can say that Alexander's sale of Alaska was incredibly short-sighted, but given Russia's stunted naval capacity, his hands were tied. It became readily apparent that Russia needed to establish a Pacific naval presence in order to have any hope of projecting power to the east and to see to the defence of its eastern coastline. Though the dream of Hyperborea was put to rest, new opportunities presented themselves. Russia's once formidable neighbour, Qing Dynasty China, was fading. By the end of the 18th century, the Qing, under its greatest emperor, Qianlong, seemed unstoppable, with 40% of the world's population, some 400 million under Qing rule. Qianlong had led, led expeditions against the Mongolic Zhongars of Central Asia, the so-called pacification of Xinjiang, as a part of the emperor's ten great campaigns. Such success proved ephemeral. In 
During the great emperor's lifetime, the imperial government's control over China's periphery lapsed, coastal defences became obsolete, the army stagnated and failed to adopt new technologies. The British exploited China's military obsolescence to devastating effect, breaking down the door of the hermit empire, pulling the Qing kicking and screaming into the world of global trade and finance. Such weakness was compounded by the Taiping Rebellion and a second war against the British, this time allied with the French, as with the Crimean War. Ironically, Russia was able to deftly exploit Anglo-French expansionism, waiting on the sidelines before issuing China an ultimatum to cede China's entire northern coastal strip up to the border with Crimea to Russia or risk invasion. With the British outside Beijing, the emperor had no choice but to acquiesce. Alexander II's grand designs in China were inaugurated through the founding of a new port city in the former outer Manchuria, Vladivostok, or ruler of the East. While the British and later other European powers were preparing to seize effective control of China's coastline via the creation of international settlements, Russian interests in the region opened the possibility for significant territorial additions to the continuous Russian Empire in the East. Vladivostok was merely a statement of intent, for Far Eastern Russia still lacked any major population centres or a warm seaport. Chita, for example, only had a population of 10,000 people by the turn of the 20th century. Expansion into China offered all of these prospects and more. Nevertheless, the Cold War with the British continued. We have seen already how the British defeated Russia in the Black Sea and ultimately precipitated Russia's loss of Alaska. In 1863, a major revolt engulfed the Russian Empire's western provinces. The rebels were drawn from the members of the old Polish-Lithuanian aristocracy. Their goal? The restoration of the Commonwealth. Failing that, major grants of autonomy, to which the Tsar was nominally beholden by treaty, in central or Congress Poland at least. The British and French supported the rebels, which backfired spectacularly when the revolt was crushed and even harsher restrictions were placed on the non-Russian ethnicities in the West. In France, the result was so detrimental as to leave her diplomatically isolated prior to the wars of German unification. To open another theatre against the British in India, the crown jewel of the British Empire, Alexander II directed Russian expansion towards Afghanistan. Having already taken Kazakhstan, the Russians conquered Bukhara by 1868, Kiva by 1873. With the annexation of the Fergana Valley and Merv in the 1880s, the Russians were bearing down in Iran and Afghanistan, with the British scurrying to prop up the Afghans as a buffer. Thus the Russians had won the first phase of the little game. If the second phase was meant to involve the disillusion or partial conquest of British India, such plans never materialised. The annexation of the Khanate of Kokand established another front against China in the West. Russia was now within striking distance of three major border regions, Xinjiang, Mongolia and Manchuria. Nevertheless, this wasn't a simple contest for territory between the British and the Russians in China, but of competing imperial philosophies. True, Hong Kong had been ceded to the British in perpetuity, and hardline imperialists such as Cecil Rhodes were anxious to seize the Chinese coastline outright, as the French had recently accomplished in Indochina. But the Chinese example was unique compared to that of India, Malaysia, or the Dutch East Indies, other empires in Asia. For the British, the Chinese Qing dynasty was sufficiently weak so as to be powerless to resist the imposition of unequal treaties, yet strong enough to allow for the British to further her economic interests without recourse to direct colonisation. The British Empire in China, therefore, took on the form of international concessions, most famously like that of Shanghai, extraterritorial grants of legal immunity from Chinese law to Westerners, and the outsourcing of administration of debt and customs to the British through the Imperial Maritime Customs Service. This pattern of indirect rule by the British is echoed in the Ottoman Empire, returning to that legacy of the Crimean War. The inherent weakness in the system was the lack of a British monopoly, and the necessity of maintaining a complicit native administration, 
British access to China from its inception was facilitated by the French. The Taiping Rebellion as a diversion at first helped the French and the British to defeat China in the Second Opium War, only for the British and French to be forced to prop up the imperial government against the Taiping rebels, lest a new Chinese dynasty fail to uphold its international obligations by the unequal treaties. The system of unequal treaties would come to involve the Germans, Italians and even Austrians, and later the Americans and the Japanese, who would come to redefine the situation in China. Russia in the 1840s, having established itself firmly on the island of Sakhalin, was again constrained by geography, this time by Japan, then under the rule of the Tokugawa shogunate. Yet it wasn't the Russians who were the first to exploit Japan's strategic potential, but the Americans, after which the Russians followed suit with a raft of unequal treaties called the Ansai Treaties, provoking the Arrow War, a secondary theatre of the Second Opium War in China. Unlike the situation in China, however, the Japanese consolidated a new regime under the Emperor, the Meiji Restoration, and began a process of self-strengthening through industrialization and military innovation, modelling an imperial Japanese navy off of the British, coupled with the purchase of a considerable number of British ironclad warships. Within a few decades, Japan had gone from a victim of unequal treaties to a beneficiary of unequal treaties in China. Indeed, Japan asserted its sovereignty and aspirations to great power status by embarking on an aggressive, preemptive strategy of forestalling European expansion into Korea, Manchuria and Formosa, modern-day Taiwan. This strategy was predicated on seizing Chinese territory and ending the Qing Empire's de jure status as a tributary empire in regards to Korea, effectively shifting suzerainty of Korea from China to Japan. Japanese control over Formosa, coupled with the recent annexation of the Ryukyu Islands, eliminated any Chinese naval threat to Japan. In Manchuria, the Japanese seized the Liaodong Peninsula between the mouths of the Daleo and Yalu rivers, gating access from the Yellow Sea to the Bohai Sea, and imperiling major international settlements of Tianjin, cutting China off from the Bay of Korea, at once consolidating Japanese influence in Korea and projecting Japanese power throughout Manchuria. As we have seen, Russia's Far Eastern expansion until the 1890s under Alexander II and III was essentially cautious, restrained by Russia's logistical limitations and the looming threat of a renewed conflict with the British. Such was the logic of the sale of Russian Alaska. Russia had been content to let the British, French and Americans lead the way in China and Japan, riding their coattails in order to participate in the unequal treaties and seize the Manchurian coastline to found Vladivostok. However, it was during the reign of Tsar Alexander III that Russia's industrialization began in earnest. The abolition of serfdom provided the basis for a new urban working class, what Marxists would refer to as the proletariat. Foreign investment trickled in from France. The proliferation of the railway led to an increase in Russian exports, particularly grain, but also increased the Russian army's mobilization efficiency. But crucially as it pertains to this topic, 1890 saw the beginning of the construction of the Trans-Siberian Railway, establishing new prospects for Russia's Asian expansionism. As we can see on this map here, the railway diverges at various points through China in the west through Outer Mongolia to Beijing, and through Manchuria to the central hub of Harbin, at which point one line leads to Vladivostok and the other to the Liaodong Peninsula. It is obvious to see the crucial significance of Manchuria, though still nominally a part of China and the homeland of the ruling Qing dynasty, the Manchus, as part of a Russian grand strategy for the east, conceiving of the territory not as Manchuria, but as Zeltorusia, Yellow Russia, which would become a necessary core for the Russian Far East. Mikhail Muravyov, the Russian Foreign Minister, referred to this as Russia's California, breaking the Russian cage to establish a viable presence in the Pacific. Japan's dramatic ascent as a regional power changed everything causing Russia to abandon its cautious approach in the east and significantly overextend in a very short time, with ruinous consequences, 
However, Russia was not the only power concerned with Japanese expansionism. The Japanese presence of Port Arthur, with its German Krupp constructive fortifications, built originally for the Chinese, alarmed the French, Russia's ally, and the Germans, with their presence in Tsingtao, nearby on the Shandong Peninsula. An ultimatum delivered by the three powers forced Japan to withdraw from Port Arthur. To add to this humiliation, Japan's attempt at establishing a puppet administration in Korea quickly failed. In their desperation, Japanese agents assassinated Queen Min of Korea, causing King Gojong to appeal to the Russians for protection. In the space of two years, Japan's victory in the First Sino-Japanese War had resulted in opening the door for Russian expansion into Manchuria and Korea. With the Chinese government powerless to resist Russian demands, in 1897 Russia acquired a lease on the recently evacuated Port Arthur and set about to consolidate its fortifications. Port Arthur, in addition to serving as Russia's only warm seaport in the Far East, opened a new front in the Great Game. Tientsin and the British concession there were now as vulnerable to Russian attack as they had been to the Japanese. The Russian presence in the Liaodong Peninsula proved a counterweight to expanding British influence in the opposing Shandong Peninsula through the British construction of Wai Hai Wei. As a display of Russia's newfound regional dominance, Mulavyov reached a detente with Britain, whereby the latter recognised Russia's new sphere of influence over Manchuria and Mongolia in return for Russian recognition of British interests in Tibet. With the port secured as the principal base for the Russian Pacific Fleet, it was now a matter of consolidating control over Manchuria, Zedolusia, to form the continuous link between the Russian Empire and its pivotal Chinese concession. The Chinese Eastern Railway Company expanded the Trans-Siberian Railway to Harbin, and from Harbin to Port Arthur and Vladivostok. Though nominally a joint venture between Russia and China, the CER was Russian-administered and furthered Russian interests. Harbin was effectively a Russian colony. Whereas Vladivostok was the ruler of the East, Harbin was the Moscow of the Orient. Economic dominance and a naval presence in Manchuria preceded military control and the prospect of wholesale colonization to realize Zeltorusia. In the 1850s, three Cossack hosts were established on the border with Manchuria, the Transbaikal, the Amur, and the Asuri. Cossacks formed the vanguard for Russian colonization. As military units, the hosts were renowned for their loyalty to the Tsar. They organized into Stanistas, self-governing communities. As the capitalists would inhabit the new urban centers, the Cossacks would take the lands home to the once great Manchu bannermen of the Qing dynasty in the countryside. The pretext for Russian conquest came with the Boxer Rebellion. Chinese nationalists, resentful of the foreign dominance and occupation, who would come later to be reluctantly patronised by the Qing imperial court. Boxers attacked missionaries, Western-owned infrastructure, and laid siege to the foreign legation in Beijing. It is not an exaggeration to say that what followed closely mirrors the Japanese occupation of Manchuria in 1931. The Boxers sabotaged the CER, the Russian-controlled railway, killed Cossacks, attacked army barracks, cut telegraph lines. In response, and as part of the Eight Power Alliance of European Powers and Japan against the Boxers, Russia invaded Manchuria with 100,000 men. Having recovered Mukden, a major stronghold on the CER, linking Harbin with Port Arthur, the Russians evicted the Chinese from the Manchurian port city of Yingkuo before moving to occupy Beijing in concert with the other powers. The Russian victory was decisive, occupying Manchuria with some 1,500 Russian casualties. In retaliation for Russian fatalities, pogroms were committed against the Manchus. Manchuria was the heart of the Qing dynasty, its point of origin, the homeland of the ethnic caste which comprised the ruling elite, including the Aisinjuro clan, the imperial family. In the 17th century, the eight Manchu banners had conquered China. The Russian invasion of 1900 finally ended the Manchu banner system, as the bannermen were disproportionately associated with the boxers and so subject to the worst reprisals. Indeed, 
the despoliation of the ruling Manchus was a necessary prerequisite for Cossack colonization, as would begin to occur. It is perhaps no wonder that what followed a decade later would be the collapse of the clan system, the Qing dynasty itself ended. By the terms of the Boxer Protocols, which ended the Eight Power Intervention, Russia was required to withdraw from Manchuria. Splits began to surface in the Russian cabinet. The most vocal anti-expansionist was Sergei Vitter, having been instrumental in the construction of the Trans-Siberian Railway, and thus one of the figures most responsible for landing Russia in this predicament, Vita contended that continued Russian occupation would do irrevocable damage to Russia's international standing and provoke a response, though no one could have anticipated the level of danger posed by Japan. The army under the Minister of War, Alexei Kuropatkin, defended the occupation, but insisted on no further provocations against the Japanese, having visited Japan in 1903 and aware that his military reforms had yet to account for basic necessities like adequate food and clothing for Russian soldiers. Above all, the Russians needed the Chinese to sanction their occupation, or at least offer sufficient compensation to justify withdrawal. Appreciating the precariousness of Russia's position, the Chinese stalled negotiations. In contrast to the anti-imperialist stance of Vita and the pragmatic approach of Kuropatkin, Alexander Bezobrazov, who could be called Russia's Cecil Rhodes, an arch-imperialist adventurer. Following the Sino-Japanese War, he petitioned Tsar Nicholas II that any expansionist moves by Russia would inevitably lead to war with Japan. Russia must therefore aggressively pursue her interests in Manchuria and Korea in tandem, establish a Russian trading equivalent of the East India Company in the Pacific, economically integrate Korea into Russia as a prelude to annexation, and co-opt Korean notables into Russian collaboration. The proposals, though ambitious, were quickly lent credence after King Gojong sought Russian protection following the assassination of the Queen. In 1901, a pro-Russian government formed in Korea and consented to the creation of the Yalu River Timber Concession, a trading company with Russian army units and Chinese paramilitary forces. For Korea's part, Russia, when compared to Japan, was perceived as the lesser of two evils, or at least a means of achieving some Korean neutrality. Bezobrazov had successfully outmaneuvered Vita forming a circle around the Tsar consisting of admirals, generals, Romanov princes, and the Dowager Tsarina. Bezobrazov's ally, Yegveni Alexeyev, was appointed Viceroy of the Far East, while Bezobrazov himself was granted carte blanche to further pursue his imperial projects. The court had decisively backed the creation of Zelta Russia and the Empire in the East. What they hadn't anticipated was the speed and decisiveness of the Japanese response. The Genro, members of Jap the Japanese oligarchy, were resolved that Russian expansion into Korea would not be tolerated, but they differed over a negotiated solution that would recognize Russia's occupation of Manchuria or a preemptive military strike. Britain was also resolved that Russia must be contained in the Pacific. The Anglo-Japanese alliance of 1902 gave the Japanese a renewed confidence in confronting Russia. Indeed, Britain was so committed to its anti-Russian policy that if Russia sought European allies in a conflict with Japan, Britain would declare war on Russia and the ally. Russian occupation of Manchuria threatened the delicate house of cards that was the system of unequal treaties and great power cooperation enforcing it. The Japanese even construed a joint attack on Korea and Manchuria as a return to diplomatic normality, a furtherance of free trade into China, and the American open-door policy. The Anglo-Japanese alliance had the intended effect. The Russian Pacific fleet was imperiled, France chose to interpret its alliance with Russia as confined to Europe, and Germany, rather than making any hard commitments to Russia, other than Kaiser Wilhelm's appeal to the Tsar to stand against the Yellow Peril, sought to use this turn of events to further undermine the Franco-Russian alliance. Russia would stand alone against Japan. Nevertheless, Russia had the advantage of time. The Trans-Siberian Railway was near completion, 
Cossack colonization was underway in Manchuria. Bezo Brazov continued to pursue economic interests in Korea as a prelude to political penetration. In 1903, the deadline for the Russian withdrawal in Manchuria came and went. Throughout the process of the Russo-Japanese negotiations, Russia offered red meat to the Japanese, opening up the prospect of a Russo-Japanese co-dominion in Korea, or assurances of Korean neutrality and a demilitarized zone in the north. Such overtures were interpreted by the Japanese as stalling tactics to keep Japan invested in continuing what was for Russia a mere facade of negotiations while the Russians strengthened their hand. Rather than wait for the Trans-Siberian Railway to be completed, the Japanese attacked the Russian fleet at Port Arthur without declaration of war. The Tsar and his ministers were so confident in their policy of prevarication that the Tsar was utterly incredulous at the news. The attack on Port Arthur was itself indecisive, yet gave the Japanese the initiative, blockading the fleet until it could attack the Pacific Squadron from both land and sea as the Japanese army laid siege to Port Arthur. With land-based artillery, the Japanese successfully sunk the Pacific Squadron. To compound the humiliation, the garrison commander of Port Arthur, Stasel, Surround, surrendered the port on his own initiative against the explicit order of his superiors, a Russian relief force having de been defeated by the Japanese at the Battle of the Yalu River. With the fall of Port Arthur, the Russian armies gathered in Mukden under Kuropatkin to begin a counter-offensive. Despite the logistical implications of transporting an army and its equipment over the Trans-Siberian Railway with its single track, Kuropatkin was able to assemble a massive force of some 300,000 men to confront the slightly smaller Japanese army under General Iwaya. The battle was the largest in history prior to the First World War, larger than Borodino and Leipzig in the Napoleonic Wars, with particular emphasis on the scale of the artillery offensives. Having lost at Port Arthur, Russia's disgrace continued. Mukden was a calamity. The Japanese occupied the south of Manchuria, and Russia was forced to retreat to the north. In response to the destruction of the naval squadron at Port Arthur, Tsar Nicholas II had sent Russia's premier Baltic fleet to the Pacific, only for the fleet to be sunk by the Japanese under Admiral Togo at the Battle of Tsushima. Russia's defeat on both land and sea was complete. Russia could only resort to prolonging the war, exploiting Russia's strategic depth and its near limitless pool of manpower. Had Russia not been rocked by revolution in St. Petersburg, it is possible that the army could have saved some face. But given the unpopularity of the war in Russia in pursuing what were ultimately expansionist and imperial aims, the Tsar had no means of continuing the war without further risk to his throne. In the ensuing American-mediated peace negotiations at Portsmouth, the Tsar's intransigence ensured that Japan was granted no territorial concessions beyond South Sakhalin and that Russia paid no war indemnity. The Japanese population took these terms to be a humiliation, but such a view was misguided. Japan had won the battle for Korea. Russia was forced to abandon Manchuria and the dream of Zeltorusia, retaining only economic concessions in Manchuria. Indeed, when Japan occupied Manchuria in 1931 and established the client state of Manchukuo, Stalin, now the leader of the Soviet Union, opted for temporary appeasement over confrontation. The Russian diaspora in the Moscow of the Orient would endure. In one of the greatest of history's practical jokes, Following the October Revolution and the Soviet victory in the Civil War, Harbin, with his extensive community of white Russian emigres, became the last outpost of Imperial Russia. But Britain was arguably as much a beneficiary from the war as the Japanese, if not more so when one considers Japanese war costs. The Russo-Japanese War, unlike Crimea, was an Anglo-Russian war by proxy. British intelligence assisted the Japanese throughout the conflict, to the extent that the Russia accused Times war correspondents as Japanese spies. British built the ships and provided the naval expertise that contributed to the Japanese victory at Tsushima. <laughs>
The Russians and the British nearly went to war over the Dogger Bank incident. Two months after the Japanese attack on Port Arthur, the French, Russia's supposed ally, entered into the Entente Cordiale with Britain. Britain denied the Baltic fleet access to the Suez Canal, forcing it to make the trip around the Cape. Indeed, the Japanese had eliminated Britain's greatest maritime rival for her. The Kaiser had hoped to induce Russia into an alliance, having exposed the perfidiousness of the English. Instead, the French effectively induced a humiliated Russia to come to an imperial settlement, specifically pertaining to spheres of influence in Iran in the Anglo-Russian Covenant, or Convention. Russia's hopes that such a rapprochement would lead to access through the Bosphorus and Dardanelles would amount to nothing. Indeed, the ultimate result of the Triple Entente was for Russia to serve as the military meat grinder in the Eastern Front of the Great War, at the cost of three million men and the empire itself. The immediate result of the Russo-Japanese War was to precipitate the Russian Revolution of 1905. The Tsar felt obliged to concede the autocracy and the convening of a parliament or Duma, thus reflecting the ideological conflict with Britain and the broader West, that of an absolute Tsar on the one hand and budding parliamentary democracy on the other. But what of Manifest Destiny denied the potential of Asiatic Russia? I qualified the greatest Russian defeat as a defeat without victory, or rather recovery, obviously without victory. Stalin was able to deftly exploit the conflict between Japan and China. Indeed, the Soviet Empire would survive and the Japanese Empire would crumble, with the core Japanese islands themselves occupied. Russia would reacquire South Sakhalin and the Kuril Islands, invade Manchuria, and break the back of the Ch Japanese Kwantung army. Kim Il-sung, with Stalin's acquiescence, would invade South Korea in the name of international communism. Stalin's short-sightedness in China was his underestimation of Mao. The Soviet Union had the opportunity to establish a Soviet Republic in Zaltorosia with the occupation. Indeed, the Soviets had tried and failed to implement a similar policy in Iran, attempting to acquire northwestern Iran for the Soviet Socialist Republic of Azerbaijan. Stalin feared that such a policy would discredit the Chinese communists and alienate what were still Russia's allies, the Americans and the United States. With the creation of the People's Republic of China in 1949, Mao pursued a ruthless policy of national reunification, conquering Tibet and redefining Manchuria as the northeastern provinces. Such policies were similarly directed against the Soviet intrigues in East Turkestan, which once again became Chinese Xinjiang. Mao was not content to be a Soviet vassal, and with the death of Stalin, there emerged a dramatic breach between the communist powers. As Gorbachev was overseeing the retraction of the Soviet empire, Deng Xiaoping was reforming the Chinese economy and ruthlessly crushing dissent as with the Tiananmen Square massacre. With the war in Ukraine, Russia is as much a Chinese dependency as China was a Soviet dependency in 1949. Dostoevsky prophesied that Russia would be a master in Asia. As it ultimately transpired, Asia would master Russia.